Hi everyone and welcome. My name is Dr. Jamie Huff. I got my PhD from Purdue University in 2018 and my research area is the rhetoric of virginity in the contemporary United States. So rhetoric is a fancy word for the way we talk about things and how that reflects and reinforces our values. And so when I say contemporary United States, I'm using a historian's definition, which really just means anything in the 20th century forward. So in particular, in my work, I look at World War II and I look at the early 2000s and I look at now. So some parts of that might not seem very contemporary to you, but for historians, that's a very recent time period. So what I look at is the way that we talk about virginity and how that reflects values here in the United States in three main areas. So in the medical area, so how do doctors and medical practitioners talk about virginity and when and why do they talk about it? In the legal sphere, so I look at laws that are passed about sexuality and the things that lawmakers and legislators say. And so it's kind of easy to see maybe why talking about sexuality in medical and legal spheres would be important to most of us. And we can kind of intuitively see that those things impact each other, right? So if you're watching this video, the reason I'm making this video is because most university classes have been moved online. And so I wanted to provide a resource for people who are teaching about sex and sexuality and gender and history. So we're in the midst of kind of a public health response right now, right? And so part of what's happening in that public health response, if you're following the news, is that doctors are talking to lawmakers and then lawmakers are passing laws at the state level or the federal level or the local level to try and curb the spread of this disease so that we minimize its impact on our population. Right? So we can see the medical sphere influencing the legal sphere and then the legal sphere influencing our daily lives through the lens of COVID-19. And this is something that happens all throughout history. So we ask medical experts to testify before lawmakers so that they can make the most informed laws. Conversely, sometimes in history, we have legal experts, legislators, um, make laws that restrict what doctors can and cannot say to their patients. And so that affects the way that healthcare is practiced and what people know about healthcare. So we can kind of see how the medical and legal spheres influence each other. But if you're like me, if you're a fairly average person, you would rather be watching Netflix than reading through legislation or the Journal of the American Medical Association. So then the question becomes, how do everyday people like you and me learn what the law is and what is legal and what our rights are and how do we learn what is good health practice, what's healthy, what's not healthy, etc. And the answer for many of us in modern society is through popular culture, right? So a lot of us have learned what we know about our rights from police procedurals on TV or from memes that our friends share. Um, a lot of us have learned what we know about health, right? Also from television, um, sometimes from Twitter. You know, we learn it in these very pop cultural places, um, not by sitting down and reading dense legal or medical texts. And so what I do in my work is look at how medical and legal rhetoric surrounding sexuality, particularly virginity, impacts each other and then how that is represented in popular culture so that most people learn about it. So that is what I do, that's my area of expertise. Um, and so what I'd like to share with you over the next couple of days is a little bit about how virginity impacts your life, even if you don't think it does. So today's lecture is about virginity and why it's important to your life. So normally at this point, when I'm giving this lecture face to face, there's a couple of eye rolls or some curious glances because we often don't feel like virginity is very important to our lives. There's certainly nothing wrong with you if you feel that virginity is important to your life. That's fine. That's a great, healthy, personal decision to make. 
Um, but for many of us, we think of virginity as being very private and not relevant to us once we've started to engage in partnered sexual activity. And so what I hope to show you by the end of today is this kind of paradox surrounding sexuality, which are the things that we think of as most private, often have huge import at the state level. And um, by state, I mean unified governing structure. I don't mean state like Washington state. Um, so when I say state, that's what I mean. I mean nation state, like the United States. So um, even if you haven't thought about your virginity or haven't felt like virginity was relevant to your life in a long time, it is still relevant to policies that impact you. And so that's what I want to talk about in this mini series and a little bit today. So what we're going to do today is a little bit of defining terms. We've already kind of started down that path. Um, so we're going to talk about what virginity is and perhaps more importantly, what virginity isn't. And then we're going to talk about why and how virginity is connected to the idea of the nation state. So let's start with what virginity isn't because there's a lot of misconceptions about that. So the first thing is that virginity is a negative identity. And what I mean by that is there's no thing you can concretely point to and say that, that right there makes you a virgin. So sometimes when I lead this um, exercise in a class, what I'll do is I'll have everyone in the class get up and shake hands with each other. That is a very big public health no-no right now. And then I'll ask everyone once they've sat back down to say who, based on shaking hands, can tell me that they shook hands with a virgin. And obviously nobody can, right? Because that's not how we assess that. So there's actually no physical thing that you can point to that will show that you are or are not a virgin. And so some of you may be thinking, well, what about the hymen? So it's important to understand what a hymen is. And to do that, we actually have to go back a little bit into how a human develops from an embryo to a fetus to a child. So as you may have learned, um, most embryos start out female, right? So this is why uh, they say this is why we all have nipples. So embryos start out female and then at a certain point in gestation, I think it's around the ninth week, but don't quote me on that because I'm not a biologist, um, there is an androgen bath of the fetus and that androgen bath and how the chromosomes respond to it determines whether that fetus continues to develop as female or develops as male. And so at that point, right, all, all of the fetuses have the same tissue and the androgen bath determines how that continues to progress. So if it continues to progress as female, then the labia separate, right? And you have the labia majora, the outer lips of the vulva. And if the fetus decide, if the fetus responds to the androgen bath in such a way that it develops as male, the labia fuse to form the scrotum, right? So it's the same tissue that develops along a different pattern. You can kind of think of it as um, every embryo is kind of like a Lego kit. And so like, Imagine everyone starts out with the same Lego kit, but what you build, um, how you arrange those bricks kind of is up to a variety of factors. So it's all the same pieces arranged in kind of different ways. So what the hymen is, I promise we're coming back to the hymen, is in people who have vaginas, the hymen um, is a piece of tissue a membrane in the vagina. So it's important to understand that despite popular conceptions of the vagina, the vagina is actually two sheets of muscle that lay against each other. So if you could get an internal view, it would look something like this, right? So if each of my hands was a muscle laying against each other, that's kind of what the vagina is in its resting state. It's not a tube, but I am going to use a tube, excuse me, for my example. So the vagina's muscle the hymen is membrane, which is a certain type of tissue that our body has. Um, so if the vagina was like this, again, it's not a tube, but if it was, um, a hymen 
is a piece of membrane that partially covers that opening. So <laughs> this is going to be my hymen for this example. I know, would that we all had rainbow hymens. So you might have heard of popping cherries or penetrating hymens um, in virgins. And we get this kind of conception that the hymen completely covers the opening of the vagina, right? That's not true at all. This is a very, very rare case. It's called an imperforate hymen. And if someone who has this starts to menstruate, it actually causes huge problems and a minor surgery needs to be done to resolve it. In most cases, the hymen as a piece of membrane, partially, it's just kind of attached to the muscle and it just kind of hangs out near the opening. So it can cover a large-ish portion of the opening it can cover a smallish portion of the opening, or it can barely cover anything at all. Um, most importantly, it's membrane, it's tissue, so it moves. It can start here, and it can move here. It can start here, and it can move here. It's a piece of tissue attached to a muscle. It moves. So the hymen itself isn't really a significant biological marker of anything. It's just kind of a piece left over in the development process. To go back to my earlier analogy, it would be like if you got done building your Lego kit and you had one leftover piece. It's not significant. It doesn't have a deep meaning. Uh, it's just there because it's part of the kit. So why is all of this important? This is important because understanding that there is no medical or physical or fixed definition of what virginity is on a body helps us to understand that virginity itself, or to be a virgin, is a negative identity. A negative identity is when your identity is made through not doing certain things. So for instance, I am a doctor because I got a PhD. I did things, I took classes and I took tests and I did a really long research project and I defended that research project. Um, and that's how I develop my expertise and why I'm talking to you today, right? Um, I am a driver because I took driving lessons and I took a driving test and I have a car and I insure that car and um, I drive places, right? So most of our identities are positive. It's because we took steps to do a thing. A negative identity is the opposite. It means that your identity is based solely on what you don't do. So virginity is the identity of having not had sex, right? So then the important question becomes, what is sex? So for many folks, the common definition of sex, and um, this isn't necessarily when I say many folks, you and the audience, I mean throughout a lot of history in different cultures and at different times, particularly in Western culture. The definition is, of sex has been something we will call PVI or penile, in, penile vaginal intercourse, right? So if to have sex, you have to have a penis and a vagina in intercourse, this raises some really interesting questions right away. Like what are lesbians doing? Are they having sex? It might seem like a silly question, but in a world where sex is synonymous with PVI, then what lesbians are doing isn't sex. But I know a lot of lesbians who definitely wouldn't call themselves virgins, right? And so this is where we get at the oddity of this definition of virgin and virginity, is that it is something that you don't do. And it turns out that what constitutes sex changes throughout time and across cultures. So you may be considered a virgin in one culture and not in another. So I'll give you a quick example of this from my research. Um, so statistically, based on polling, most young people believe that sex is PVI, right? And if you have not done PVI, but you have had intimate contact with a partner in other ways, say oral sex, um, then you are still considered a virgin. You have some experience, but you're technically a virgin. There are communities, I used to be part of one in the United States, um, that are very based on the purity of young people. 
And um, you are not really considered pure or virginal if you've even had thoughts about sex. So those are very different definitions of what constitutes sexual activity and therefore very different definitions of what it means to be a virgin. And that's all right here in the United States. We don't have to look to other countries. We don't have to look back through history to find those examples, although we certainly could find them if we did choose to look. All right, so virginity is a negative identity. It's based on things that you don't do, particularly not having sex. The other thing to know about the word virgin and virginity is that in its original language, Latin, it meant young girl or unmarried woman. And so even the root of the word really places an emphasis on female bodies. And you'll see if you look at the way that we talk about virginity in our culture, although technically in the way that we use the word now, people of all genders and sexualities can be virgins, you will find again and again an emphasis on women and women's bodies. Okay, so why is any of this important? You might be thinking, okay, Jamie, that's, you know, some stuff I didn't know before maybe, but why are we talking about this? Well, it turns out there's this fascinating historical coincidence. So we've noticed, historians have noticed, and sociologists have noticed, and a variety of scholars from different fields have noticed that every time we see the emergence of the nation state, we see two other things happening at the same time. We see the development of patriarchal culture. And so I'll come back to talk about what patriarchal culture means in a second. And we see the development of virginity. So those three things happen at the same time. So we see a nation state, so that would be kind of like what we consider the modern nation, um, a state that is hierarchical, uh, governed by shared laws, usually uniting people from different cultures under kind of like shared conventions and commonalities, um, usually having some kind of military. So when we see the rise of the hierarchical nation, hierarchical, hierarchical, can't talk anymore today, I'm sorry. When we see the rise of the nation state, we also see the rise of patriarchal culture as opposed to either matriarchal cultures or egalitarian cultures that existed pre-nation state. And this is the only time in history when we start to see the writings of about women's sexuality and particularly virginity become really important. So the records that we have from more egalitarian band societies or the few matriarchal societies suggest that virginity wasn't something they concerned themselves with. So how are those three things connected? Well, to understand that, we have to talk a little bit about what patriarchy is. So this might be a term that you've heard before and uh, it gets it used as shorthand for the rule of men. The literal translation is the rule of the fathers. So uh, in ancient Greece and ancient Rome, you would have people who were patriarchs and a patriarch was a wealthy landowning man who was the head of his household. And that household included his women, his children, his slaves, and any livestock that they had in any lands. And so he was, the patriarch was the absolute ruler of everyone and everything in that household. And so classic patriarchal theory in political science holds that all rulers are like patriarchs. So patriarchs are rulers within their home and then the ruler of a nation is like the patriarch of that nation. So that's not something that we have in the United States, but we do still have a form of patriarchy. And um, legal scholar Carol Pateman calls this the fraternal patriarchy. And so fraternal patriarchy is where all men are equal to each other, but all men have power over women. And so Pateman in her book, The Sexual Contract, 
makes a really compelling, well-researched, well-argued argument that we live in a fraternal patriarchy in the United States. I'm not going to go into a ton of that here. That would be kind of a separate lecture, but you can certainly look up Pateman. She's excellent. Her book is a great read. So if we live in a fraternal patriarchy, why is virginity still important? What is it about virginity that is foundational to the rise of male power organized in a way that we would recognize as the state? So the key lies in the primary function of virginity. Now, most of us are introduced to the concept of virginity either in an educational setting or a faith setting. So we often think it has to do with health or we think it has to do with morality in some way, and it really doesn't. Um, I have read the whole Bible cover to cover twice, and there's not a lot in there about virginity, guys. Um, if you have further questions, you can always message me, and I'll be happy to talk about that in more detail. But what I'll just tell you now is that virginity is not, as we talked about earlier, a health concern, nor is it a religious or moral concern. The primary function of virginity is economic. And what I mean by that is that virginity in a patriarchal culture is how you make sure that if your power is passed down through your children, and in particularly if it's passed down in a patrilineal way, patrilineal meaning from father to son, that your power goes to the right sons. So for most of human history, there wasn't a way to test whether your son was your son, right? This is why in some places where heredity is really important, they go through the mother's lineage and not the father's. So for instance, in the Jewish faith, um, you are Jewish if you're born to a Jewish mother. So for instance, my grandfather was born to a Jewish mother, and so he was Jewish, but he did not marry a Jewish woman. And so his children were not born to a Jewish mother, and so they are not considered Jewish. Now, I don't know a ton about... Um, Jewish liturgical law. So there could be a nuance there that I'm missing. I'm just pulling from my family example to give kind of a grasp on this concept because it can be a little slippery. So um, most historical patriarchal cultures are also patrilineal. So power accumulates to men and men pass that power on through their sons. So you can think of most monarchies that you're familiar with. So let's just take the British monarchy, right? They've had a few queens, but by and large, it has been from father to son, king to king, king to king, right? So if you spend your life accumulating wealth and property and power, and you want to pass that on to your son, but before DNA tests, you want to make sure your son is your son, how do you do that? Well, the best way to do that is to strictly control the sexuality of women. So making sure that women are virgins before marriage and that they are punished if they are not chased within marriage. So if a woman you marry only ever has the opportunity to have children with you, then you can sleep easy at night knowing that your children are your children and the inheritance you've accumulated for them will be passed to only your children and not someone else's. And so that's what I mean when I say that virginity's function is primarily economic. Now, certainly over the course of human history, we have woven in kind of other factors, particularly religious factors, but its primary function is to make sure that property passes to the right hands. And so to answer the question that I posed to you earlier, why do we see the rise of the state, the rise of patriarchy, and virginity at the same time? It would be because the state is a fundamentally, um, I'm going to try and say that word again, hierarchical structure. You have to have someone at the top, and then you have people under them, and you have people under them, and under them, all the way till you get to the bottom, right? And so we see the state rise, 
in contrast to cultures that came before it, which were in general more egalitarian, right? So everyone had different roles, but one wasn't prioritized over another. Leadership shifted um, to who was the best leader. It wasn't necessarily passed down family to family. Um, and so we see this rise of hierarchy in the patriarchal state. And we see that rise of hierarchy accumulating around men, right? So the idea that you have the king at the top and the peasants at the bottom. And so virginity facilitates the rise of that hierarchy in two ways. First, by subject subjugating all women to men, right? So you might be a peasant in a patriarchal state, but you still have authority over your wife and your children. And that's the power that you have, um, even if someone else, like the king, has power over you. So the, so the sexual subjugation of women and the controlling of women's bodies and sexuality both gives power to men. We see power accumulate. And it ensures that the patriarchal state progresses without any hiccups by making sure that accumulated power is only passed along through the family line. And so that is why we see virginity emerge at the same time as the patriarchal state in culture after culture. And if you want more resources, res I really can't talk today, guys. I'm sorry. If you want more resources on this, you can look at Fatima Mernessi's Virginity and Patriarchy, at Sherry Ortner's Virginity in the State, and at Gerda Lerner's The Creation of Patriarchy. Um, those are some really good starter texts for understanding the connections. Um, all three of those texts look at uh, research from all over. Um, so they pull a lot of different research for you. Um, so I hope this has been a good explanation of what virginity is and isn't, uh, and why virginity might be a little bit more important to you than you think, because it's actually foundational to the idea of the nation state. And we, you and I, live in a nation state, particularly we live in a patriarchal nation state, which is why, um, even though in some ways virginity seems like an outdated silly concept, it's actually still really important. And the government spends hundreds of millions, actually over a billion dollars, legislating and trying to enforce virginity both at home and abroad. So that's a topic for another lecture. Um, I'm also gonna talk about the virgin whore dichotomy in pop culture and how those ideas around women's sexuality are, uh, taught to us from a very young age and what they do. Um, and I'll have another lecture up soon about the spread of venereal disease or what we would call sexually transmitted infections in World War II and the control of women's sexuality. And uh, last but not least, I will have a lecture up on sex education and abstinence in the modern U.S. from 2001 until today. So if any of those are interesting, you can pop, pop back by. I'm trying to get a lecture up every day. Um, I hope this has been helpful. And if you have any questions, just let me know. Thanks.